um, choosing me, you could have chosen hundreds of other preachers. Um, instead, you chose me, and I really appreciate you having me here during this um, gospel series. Um, we have going through a few lessons so far, and today we're going to wrap it up with this new title of being a brave adventurer. So, we've the title of the city was about a vacation in paradise. The fact that we are on our way to heaven, but while before we get to heaven, there's a lot of challenges and difficulties that we have to face here on earth. And during this series, we've studied about different aspects of that journey and how we face sometimes troubles and challenges. Last week, uh, yesterday, I'm sorry, last night we talked about um, the lesson about getting through customs and the idea of presenting before customs and of course being allowed to get in. And I want to pick up from where we left last week, uh, from yesterday with, um, with a small illustration about just to get your blood flowing a little bit about a, uh, about a man who died and presented to the customs in heaven. And Peter asked him, why should I let you in heaven? And the man said, well, I try to help other people. And Peter said, well, can you give me an example? And he says, yes, once I was on a roadside and this hell's angels came and they were really giving an old lady a very hard time. And um, they had knives and guns. They were scaring everybody. And I stepped up and said, hey, what are you guys doing here? Get out of here. Leave this lady alone. So, um, and then he told them, while you're at it, why don't you get your filthy friends and get, get out of here? And uh, Peter says, wow, that's pretty impressive. When did this happen? And he says, well, about five minutes ago. So, <laughs> um, I don't know if he was allowed in heaven or not, but um, I just wanted to start with that. So when it comes to being um, an adventurer, um, as we go in through this, through this um, journey on this earth, um, as much as hard as it is, um, it's good for us to be an adventurer, right? And an adventurer implies the idea that sometimes things may be dangerous, maybe you'll face some exciting experiences, um, sometimes maybe some troubles, and you have, may, may have gotten, some people like adventures more than others. I've had my share of adventures. As I'm getting older, I'm not so adventuristic anymore. I'll tell you one example. I was once with my friend Mark Butchery on the Black Sea in Romania, that same sea that Mark had up here. And we were on a small rubber boat, very small. And we didn't imagine that if the wind changed direction, it could pull us so far into the, into the sea. We um, had hardly anything to eat. We had, I think, just a chocolate, right? Essential nutrients. And, and, and a bottle of Coca-Cola, our favorite drink. And then when we realized it started raining and quite an adventure, the waves pushed us so far in the ocean. And we thought, okay, this was going to be it. Um, by the glory of God, we were able to find our way back because the wind settled. But you may have in your life some experiences like that, that you can say, boy, that was an adventure. Our journey, however, as a Christian, certainly is an adventure. And while we at it, might as well make it a, a brave adventure so that, um, so that um, it's not some boring experience, right? So the definition of an adventure is something, it's sometimes dangerous, right? Exciting, exciting experience. Um, adventurer is a person who even seeks adventure, a person willing to take risks. And really, as Christians, God saves us to really go on a great adventure. He has called us he, and he has saved us for a purpose. He hasn't saved us to watch Netflix and just eat popcorn or just to enjoy life and go on trips and have vacations and do all that. And that's great. It's good to have those too. But God has reborn us in order for us to be on a great mission, uh, on a great adventure. In Acts chapter 9, we see Paul's adventure as God called him and gave him a very brave adventure. And Paul certainly was a brave adventurer through what he did. In Acts chapter 9, here he says, Then Ananias answered, this is shortly at, um, at around the time that he obeyed the gospel. He says, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much harm he has done to you. This is Ananias speaking to God and your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all 
who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, said to Ananiah, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, Paul certainly was a very special person that God has selected him from such a critical mission. But God also is choosing us for a very critical mission. I will drink a little bit of water. So, what is for us the bold adventure that God has placed before us? And... For the sake of time, um, I'm only going to touch on a few items that really, um, really pinpoints a bit on what it means, the fact that God has put us on a great adventure. And one of the greatest adventure that we ought to live as Christians is that we need to live our faith. So many people in this world, they say, I got faith. But of course, if you don't have the works... Um, um, you don't really have faith, right, as, as James is calling us. First Peter chapter 3, when it comes to what it means to live our faith, we see in First Peter chapter 3 there it says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessings. For he who loves life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit and let him turn away from evil and do good. So many Christians in this world, they try to have a cake and eat it too. They try to be a nice person, but at the same time they have one foot in the world. Um, I have an illustration around that that I hope I could drive this point home with this illustration about a good old boy that came down from the mountain one day. He thought he was a Christian, but he was all dressed up and carrying his Bible underneath his, um, his um, armpit. So a friend saw him and said, hey, George, where are you going? You know, all dressed up nice like that. You know, where are you going? Uh, it looks like you're going somewhere. And he said... Um, you know, I've never, I've heard of New Orleans, and I'm going to go to New Orleans. He said, I heard that there's a lot of free-running liquor, and a lot of gambling, a lot of shows that are a bit naughty. And then he said, the friend looked at him up at George, what are you doing with your Bible underneath your arm? And he said, well, if it's as good as they say they will, I may stay through till Sunday. So, yeah, I'm going to partake of all of that, but if it's so great, I'm going to go worship God on Sunday. And... That captures a bit about just human being. You think you're going to have a little bit of both. You think you're going to enjoy this life and just have all this life that has to offer to all the worldly people and engage in sin. And then at the same time, you're going to go worship God and have this awesome relationship with God. And certainly we know that it doesn't work that way. And obviously you can say, well, this is a joke. This would never happen, right? But this happens sometimes. This very much happens sometimes. So there are people who live one way at church and then entirely different the rest of the week. A totally different per person the rest of the week. And we shouldn't be those kinds of people. That does not make us a brave adventurer. You just go through an adventure, but you wouldn't be very brave to, uh, to be able to resist uh, the, the Satan's attacks. So they do things throughout the week that they wouldn't dream of doing necessarily the church building. And this is certainly no way to live your faith. We cannot go through this world living our faith like that good old boy from um, um, wh where he was going from the mountains. Just think about it. So we should eagerly live our faith in such a way that people know that we not only stand for purity and good doctrine, but we live our faith. If we don't live our faith, um, this exercise that we're doing is in vain. We're just wasting our time if we don't live our faith, if we don't put our actions where our, where our thoughts are, when we think that we're going to just str straddle the fence. So, first, as I mentioned, bold adventurers, we are called to live our faith. And um, while we live our faith, it is important for us not to be afraid. 
It's so easy to be afraid of things that are happening around us. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 says, Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. So, do not fear. This is a commanded, commandment in the Word of God that is constantly repeated. And even as Christians, we say, yeah, we're not afraid. We have God on our side. But sometimes something happens and we can have signs of, of some fear. And we shouldn't. Someone apparently counted all the verses in the Bible that talks about fear and they found about 365. And that means you get one do not fear for every day of the week. Every day of the year, I'm sorry, right? So um, fear, we are told not to fear. And really, that's something that we can do. God never asks us for something we can do. Um, somebody said, and I, I stay with me, that fear is created in our minds. Fear is not something that you can if you don't create in your, in your mind, fear doesn't exist. You have a lion in the room and all of a sudden something triggers in your brain and all of a sudden you feel afraid. Um, but we are told not to be afraid. And we unfortunately can get afraid more often than we like to admit sometimes. And we may think that that's normal. In Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. God there speaks. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. Multiple times in the scriptures, God is telling his people, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, don't be afraid of them, don't be afraid of them. John chapter 7, Jesus there reminds his disciples and us, and reminds us, when he walked in their midst, he says, peace I live with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We are not to be afraid. So we can be bold adventurers because God has promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. And we have really no reason to be afraid. God told us stories throughout the Bible of great men and women who struggle with fear. But then through faith, they, they were able to, to move fear out of the way. Folks like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were supposed to be thrown into the, into the furnace of fire. And um, they were not afraid. And you may say, boy, they should have been afraid. They were not afraid. And they are our examples, really, of uh, what a bold adventurer, how we ought to not be afraid of things that are happening along us on this journey. So, the more we draw closer to God, certainly the less afraid we will be. And the more we do things we shouldn't, the more afraid we will be. So, if you don't live the way that God asks you to live, uh, you will be more afraid, right? Um, Tamara had a wonderful dinner tonight, and she fed us all. But I'm so thirsty. I can, like, I need to constantly drink water. Appreciate, by the way. Everybody's hospitality. Many of you have had us in your home and invited us over. We are very, um, I'm very honored, me and my wife, and I'm glad I took my kids with me, but it's been really um, an unforgettable experience for us, and I want to thank you for that. Um, next time I'll have less. <laughs> Tamara, thank you. So um, I was saying that in our, in our spirit of being an adventuristic and a brave adventurer, as I mentioned, the closer we draw to God, the less afraid we will be. The closer we are to God, the less afraid we will be. Just the same way that that child, when he's next to the father, the closer the father is, you're not going to be afraid, as opposed to your father's not present. And the opposite works as well. If you do things that you shouldn't, you're going to be further away from God, and you are going to be afraid. You are going to be afraid. To exemplify this, this thought, I have uh, one other um, illustration about a man who was driving a car. I don't know if you've heard this story before. I don't know if it was real or not, but probably not. Let's see if he was. You tell me afterwards if he was. A man was driving a car down the road and was stopped by a police officer and got very afraid, right? You're, you got, get pulled over by a police officer and you, you're on your best behavior and your heart starts beating and he, he was a little bit afraid. So the police officer came up to the car and said to the man, you know, what's the problem, officer? And the officer said, well, you're going 75 miles, and it was 55 speed zone. 
And the man says, no, I was. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't doing 75. I was, going, I was going to speed limit or just a little bit over. And the wife says, now, Harry, you know you're going 80. And that's not a good thing to keep right, when a cop pulls over. And then the officer says, I'm also going to have to give you a ticket for a broken taillight. And the man says, broken taillight? I didn't know I had a broken taillight. And, and the wife says, well, Harry, you know you've had that taillight broken for six months. I was like, honey. Um, and the officer said, well, I'm also going to give you a citation for not wearing a seat belt. And the man says, oh, I just took it off when I saw you walking. They always say that, right? And his wife says, now, Harry, you know you never wear your seat belt. And at this point, the man is really exasperated and says, woman, would you just please shut up? And the, the officer turned to the woman and said, ma'am, is your husband always talks like this and be so aggressive to you? And he said, no, just when he's drunk. So <laughs> when you are doing something you shouldn't do, you're going to be afraid. You're going to be afraid. But if you do what's right, then you don't have to be afraid. So um, um, it's um, hard to be a bold adventurer if you are constantly in fear because you fear one thing or another. So... Fear and boldness just don't go together. Can you be happy and afraid at the same time? Have you ever tried that? I'm very happy, but boy, I'm so afraid. They don't work together. You cannot be happy and afraid. You cannot be confident and afraid. You cannot be merciful and afraid. No positive, positive trait works with, I mean, you're going to be one or the other. Can you have faith, be full of faith and full of love and be afraid? It's not possible. The scripture says in 1 John chapter 4, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So you see how you cannot have fear in the presence of, of love. Just the same way you cannot have darkness in the presence of light. They just exclude. Light excludes the darkness the same way that love and faith in God excludes fear. So, uh, third point that I have tonight is that as part of being a bold adventurer is that we need to be a warrior in prayer. And I will tell you that when it comes to prayer, prayer is my most favorite topic of all the Bible passages. And um, every time that I speak, I, I like to incorporate a topic around prayer. And I feel a little bit like that gospel preacher from a Church of Christ that was invited to a, do a gospel um, series at a Baptist church and says, what should I preach about? He says, preach on everything except baptism. He says, okay, I'll try. And he goes and says, you know, uh, the, so what should I preach about? He says, well, you should preach about um, a Red Sea, about the Red Sea. And he says, first day, first lesson, he says, I, um, I'm here to talk about the Red Sea. So Red Sea is about water, so we're going to talk about baptism. So to me, it's a little bit the same when it comes to um, the topic of prayer, because you cannot be a brave adventurer without talking about being a warrior in prayer, having a really solid life of prayer. So in Matthew, and I would like to start this uh, point in Matthew chapter 26, where it says, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Later on, Peter said to him in verse 35, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so he said all the disciples, so said all the disciples. And Jesus came with them at a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little bit further and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my father, it is 
impossible. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not wash with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So this was the time when Jesus was going to experience the most challenging part of his ministry. He was about to be offered in agony and die on the cross for the remission of mankind. And Jesus knew that this was going to be a very tough time to go through. And John chapter 6 verse 38 says, Jesus says, For I have come down from earth, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And in verse 39 in Matthew says, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as you will. So Jesus anticipated the crisis and prepared for it. Of all the people that you would consider that maybe you don't need so much prayer would be God himself, right? Jesus Christ. But he prayed more than anybody else. And Jesus prepared for the events that were about to happen. He prepared for them in the most effective way known under the sun, and that is by going to God in prayer ahead of time. You go to, head, to God in prayer ahead of time. So the disciples were also about to face a very difficult time, um, but unlike Jesus, they didn't, really, they didn't really take much time to pray. Um, they didn't take time to pray, and partly... They did not know maybe the gravity was about to happen. Maybe they were too sleepy to prepare. Um, they probably had all kinds of reasons. Partly maybe they didn't even believe Jesus was going to be killed. As you know, they were shocked when they realized that this is happening and Jesus really was going to be killed. They didn't believe it until the last minute. If you remember, Peter was rebuked him when he told him that he was going to die. So... The disciples, I say, carelessly, pr prayerlessly, sleepily, they allow themselves to be carried by circumstances into the most severe crisis of their life. So instead of praying, they didn't pray. They didn't prepare by prayer. And the result of their failure to anticipate was that one betrayed our Lord. We know it very well, right, Judas? Another one denied our Lord. Um, Peter, and everybody else pretty much forsook the Lord. Why? Because they didn't pray. They didn't prepare by prayer. The same thing with us, brothers and sisters. If we don't prepare ourselves by prayer, when challenges happen, and make no mistake, challenges will happen, we will not be ready, just like the disciples were not ready. So Jesus gave his disciples then and has given us today the same words as a tremendous piece of advice. And he tells them, watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation for the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the prayer that Jesus prayed that night is what is called the anticipatory prayer. You know that something was going to happen and you pray about it. And that is he prayed in anticipation of something that he knew was coming so that he can prepare himself for it. Just like that athlete, when you know you are preparing for a game or for something very important, and you just prepare for it. It reminds me of an example of Michael Phelps, what is his name? The big swimmer. I read something about his interview that he had, and when it comes to him being so successful, he said that for the past, I don't know how many years, there was not a day that he was not in the water swimming for hours and hours. He was preparing constantly being prepared and we also as we go through this world with everything happening we also have to be prepared and we prepare by prayer so we need to practice anticipatory prayer because battles are lost before they are fought I have a quote you may have heard by uh, this uh, author Sun Tzu he wrote a book called The Art of War if you haven't read it you, you should it's a great book it's not a spiritual book but it's a great book um, he said that every battle is won before it is fought. You win the battle before you fight it. Battles are always won before they are being fought. And this is true 
of nations across time. And if it was true of Israel in the Old Testament, if Israel, they were not praying before they were going to go into the battle, normally they wouldn't win if they didn't go with God behind them. When, and then when they went in filled with sin and without prayer, they didn't win in battle. So battles are lost when people are not prepared for them. You're going to go into a battle, you're not prepared, you're going to lose that battle. You're going to lose that battle. So due to a lack of preparation, battles are lost before they happen, really. I mean, if you don't prepare, don't train for something, and then the test comes, are you going to pass that test? You didn't prepare for it. And you, pra what do they say? You, you play as you practice, right? So if you don't prepare well, you're not going to perform well. So the disciple didn't lose in the morning when one of them cursed and said, I am not his disciples. That's not when they lost the fight. That's not when they lost the battle. Even when John, who loved Jesus, forsook him and fled, and every disciple just disappeared, that's not because they were afraid. That's not when they lost the battle. That's not what they lost the battle. The collapse had started the night before when they were so tired and instead of listening to the words of Jesus and praying, they just decided to sleep. Take a nap and not be prepared. So, if they had stayed awake and prayed alongside with Jesus and heard maybe his groans and seen his bloody sweats, they would have done better. You know, sometimes it's, it's, it's mind-boggling that they did not really read the body language, right, of Jesus. He was crying. How can you not see Jesus crying and being in agony and seeing his tears turn into drops of blood? They were just sleeping. They're like, what are you doing? Just go to bed. Although Jesus told them what was about to happen. They just, okay, didn't even make, connect the dots. So, as I mentioned, not only battles are lost before they even fought, battles are also won before they are even fought. If you, your mind takes you a little bit to little David when he went out with a few stones, but one stone really is what, what um, you know, made him successful in the battle with, with Goliath. So, and then with, with his, with, that pretty much end up killing Goliath with his own sword, right? Um, so, when did David, do you think, won that battle? Do you think he was a boy? Oh, how you doing? I'm here to fight a battle. That's not when he won the battle. He won the battle when he was praying to God. When he was, if you remember the prayers, one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible, when he prays to God that he gives him success over Goliath. And when Goliath cursed him, he says, you come to me with javelin and sword, but I come to you with God. And that's where what his strength was. And that's what gives him courage. And he was unafraid because of it. So it was not that morning when he fought Goliath. David was a man of prayer. And he had learned that when God sent a man, that man can conquer any enemy, no matter how strong, if God is with you. There's nothing to be afraid if God is with you. And David knew that. If you go further for another character, Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but you know the story. He defeated Ahab and Jezebel and she ended up being eaten by dogs and lost in an epic way. So again, when did he do it? When did Elijah win that battle? Was it, was it right then when all the Prophets of Baal were getting ready, and was it that morning? His prayer that day wasn't even very big prayer. It was like 30 seconds. That's not really what did it. That's not really the preparation he had. Okay, I'm going to go into the battle with the, how many? 300 prophets of, of Baal, and I'm just going to say a 30-second prayer. That's not when it happened. That prayer of 30 seconds, that's not the prayer that brought down fire from heaven. So when did this confidence come from? That confidence came from his faith in God. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So the men whose prayer are many and strong will not collapse in the day of trouble. 
So I don't know how strong you are or how strong you think you are. I love this passage because it says, if you collapse in a day in adversity, when things get hard, you are just weak. If you prepare by prayer, you will not be weak and you'll be strengthened in God. So we have to pray to God before problems arise. We see our problems as one-dimensional, but oftentimes God sees the problems in many facets. Sometimes, oh, I got a problem. But it's by prayer that you realize that that problem is much more complex than you see it. Much more complex than we see it, unfortunately, sometimes. And if you don't pray to God, God will not reveal to you maybe other facets of the problem. And God will say, okay, well, he's, he doesn't need me. It reminds me a little bit about my kids. You know, when they have trouble with school, they come to me, Daddy, can you please help me with this? I'm not going to put any of my kids on the spot because I'm going to hear all about it in the car. But if they come to me and says, hey, I need help. You know, can you help me? Then I sit down with them. Okay, today's uh, lesson is about sine and cosine. <sighs> Geometry, I haven't done that since high school, 30-some years ago. I have no clue about sine and cosine. But you can go on YouTube, you know, and you can find out what that is. And then I can help him. And then he can get good grade. And if he doesn't ask for my help, his grade is not going to be so good. But then he keeps on coming to me. So we are all right. Um, so yes, much more complex. So if the problem is extremely difficult, one needs divine insight and discernment along with the word of God and prayer so that the different parts of the problem are revealed to him. And that is because we should be aware that in life, there will always be problems. You know that already. That's not a secret. But a disaster occurs somewhere in the world almost every single day. And especially now with the news media, you hear it like right when it happens. Seems like there's a lot more than there used to be. It's just that tr news travels so much faster. So every year, natural disaster kills around 90,000 people and affects about 160 million people worldwide. And one statistic that I saw, that you might want to remember this, this is a statistic that says that in a person's life, in your life, you should expect a pretty major problem, something big, about every 7 to 10 years. Did you know that? Every 7 to 10 years, the odds are you're going to experience some kind of life-changing event to where something significant, like you lose a job, you, you lose a loved one, Something terrible happens to where, whoa, this is not just a normal problem I'm running. So we should know that in life, sometimes things like this will happen from time to time. But if you are prepared by prayer, when it comes, then you prepare. So as I mentioned, what you can do about it, you can prepare for it. Unfortunately, all those, everybody should be prepared. 49% of Americans could cover less than one month's expense if they lose their income. How sad is that? Half of Americans, if they lose their job, they cannot pay their bills. And it's not because this is a poor country. It's not because our salaries are so small. I mean, it's because of lifestyle and not really thinking ahead, not planning. Half of this culture has virtually no buffer between them and life. And you know what happens? Here comes Murphy, right? It's like somebody, you know, somebody buys a, an expensive house they shouldn't buy, big house, and they have this huge mortgage. And then they say, four-bedroom house, and they say, then Murphy occupies the four-bedroom. And then constantly, always things happen, because you didn't prepare, and you, you made poor decisions. Murphy's Law says, nothing is as easy as it looks. Everything takes longer than you expect. If anything could go wrong, it will go wrong, and at the worst possible moment, Right? So problems are less frequent, however, when you're prepared. If you're prepared, then it's not a big problem. Not a big problem. You know, you know your air conditioning. I appreciate it. I, of all the things, I go in, the, in Brent's house and say, oh, you got a, such a nice new air conditioning system. Because it's nice. Because then you don't have to worry about it breaking. But if you know that you have an air conditioning that's dying, well, maybe you can prepare for it. So then when it dies, you have the money saved for it, right? And it, then Murphy doesn't bother you so much because then you're prepared, right? So in everyone's life, again, problems will happen sometimes as we go on this journey. And this journey, you know, tough as it is, 
in this world that it feels like we don't belong, problems will happen sometimes. The question is, are you going to be prepared? Because expecting others and the government to rescue you in times of crisis, that's a terrible plan. There's a lot of people, if you go to L.A., that they expect their government to protect and they're homeless. They don't have anything. And I know there's a lot of mental cases and very sad stories, but do not expect the government to think that they're going to rescue you. And unfortunately, it's sad how many people rely on the government, rely on the family, rely on their children or their mothers or their fathers to provide for them. Why? Because they're not prepared. So the only way to win battles is to keep the blood on the doorposts. You get that? That means be prepared. Keep your fighting clothes on. And you never allow a day to creep on without prayer. Never let a day worry you because you didn't pray the day before. And finally, see that you get prayed up somewhere before the trouble happens. Because you're going to have troubles every day. And if you're going to be prepared for it, you like you see it coming, right? And you're prepared. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. I'm almost to the end of my lesson, by the way. I timed it somewhat decent tonight. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He says, He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all. Is it possible that, having been given us his son, that he would not give us everything else too? That's from a paraphrase translation, and I really like that because it's, it's a translation in, in um, more of a conversational English. But it tells us he gives us his son. If you pray for it, don't you think he'll give you everything else too? He will. But you have to pray. You have to be prepared by prayer. Because as I mentioned, as we go on this journey, this temporary place, hard as it is, as we're living in this tent, We have to be prepared and we need to do everything we can so that we're not slowed down. It's so easy. Something happened and you exit and then you get stuck somewhere on an exit instead of continuing on your journey. So I believe this is my last slide and I would like to end this sermon, this night and this gospel meeting with one last illustration to wake you up before we leave. Um, and this is about a lawyer, a doctor, and a preacher who went deer hunting. I know I, we have a few people that love hunting here. Deer hunting went together, and along came this big buck, and all three of them shot at the same time, and the buck is down on the floor. And then immediately they rushed to examine the deer, but they couldn't figure out who actually killed it. And say, okay, who does it belong to? And then um, they were in the middle of a heated argument, when uh, a warden, a game warden, came by and said, hey, what's this fuss? And um, they said, well, you know, we all shot at the buck, but, you know, uh, we, sorry, we don't know who shot the buck. And then the warden goes and expect, inspects the buck, and he says, the preacher shot the buck. And I was like, oh, wow, how in the world do you know? Well, the bullet, it went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> I hope well, I mentioned that is because it's so easy to hear the gospel and Bible messages and then one ear out the other. So I don't know when I'm going to see you again. Who knows? Life is so short. You or I could, could be gone and our journey on this earth could be ended so quickly. But let us all be committed when the word of God comes to us. When we know what we ought to do, don't find excuses. Don't let the word of God come one year out the other. Do what you need to do. So in the day of judgment, when you come before customs in heaven, you'll be allowed entrance in paradise. So with that, I appreciate you being here tonight, especially um, our favorite guest. I believe everybody else is a member here, but we're really happy that you're here. And with this, again, thank you very much, and I will turn it over to Brent, or to the song leader. Thank you, sir. Do not let the